It's joint with uh, uh, Kyle, Guido, and, and Gordon. And uh, it's still, it, there's a fair amount there, but it's still kind of ongoing. And this is actually the first time I've given it. So we'll, we'll see how, uh, how we go through here. So the, what we're sort of interested in is what is the role of coworkers in terms of human capital accumulation on the job, in the sense of how important is it that I have good coworkers for my uh, future career path, OK? Um, and so a typical way that we often uh, model learning on the job is just some exogenous process. You, you put in your hours, your human capital is in increasing, right? Um, but it seems natural, at least for, from introspection, that it's going to matter sort of what you're doing and who you're working with. Okay? So I've done a little bit of work on the more what you're doing uh, with, a, with another co-author, Fabien post -Avene. Here we're really interested in, in, in terms of how important is uh, the effect of, of having people who know more than me, can teach me some things, and, and can go on. Okay? Um, uh, we just took that, uh, that quote in there. Okay? So what we're going to do in this paper is we're going to develop a labor market model. It's going to be a, an equilibrium labor search model where the learning that happens depends, uh, or the human capital accumulation that happens is going to depend on the quality of coworkers. Okay? We're going to do some data work, so we're going to try to measure um, how important, uh, or, or what does the relationship look like between a worker's future labor market outcomes and the characteristics of her, uh, of her current uh, co-workers. Right? So the data that we're going to be using there is the, the US matched uh, worker from data, the LEHD. Okay? And then we're going to combine those two things to, have, to try to say something about the, the role of uh, social learning uh, in, the, in the workplace. Okay. Now, the, the model is going to be a version or a generalization we're going to be building on uh, the search model by uh, uh, Fabien post and, and uh, Jean-Marc Robin. And sort of the, the bits we're, we're adding in here is we're going to think of um, production taking place in teams. So the, the, most of these models, uh, um, this one in, in particular, uh, you may have multiple workers at the firm, but they're all just sort of doing their own thing independent of each other. Here. And so here we're going to have, um, you know, my coworkers are going to affect the, the output. Okay? We're, still, we're going to want to be able to do this in a tractable way, so that's why the word team is there, and it's really going to be pairs or singles. Okay? So we're going to, we're going to approximate uh, multiple, you know, many worker firms by, by two worker firms here. Uh, you, it's going to be a sequential thing, so you start out small, you start hiring people, and you get big, where big means two. Okay? And you might swap some out once in a while. Okay? Um, so the firm's output's going to depend on the human capital of the workers that it has. Okay? So to the extent that there's um, complementarity in production across workers. This is a natural force for positive sorting. You want the good workers together to be producing. Uh, on top of that, the, the human capital that's going to be accumulated by the workers is going to depend on the quality of their co-workers. And so that, you know, other things equal, is going to uh, be a force in the other direction, sort of negative sorting, right? You would like, if you want to build up the human capital, you'd like to put the, the low human capital guys with high human capital guys so they can quickly learn some stuff. And so these are going to be moving in different ways, and we're going to try, uh, we're going to, try to tease out from uh, the data that we have, uh, you know, sort of which forces are working where and, and get some numbers on that, okay? Um, so there, we're, the firms here are going to be homogeneous ex ante, and the heterogeneity that's going to exist across firms is going to be because they have different workers. Okay. All right. In terms of a, of a preview of you know sort of the stylized things we're going to pull out of this uh, this data in terms of the relationship of, of future outcomes uh, to past coworkers. Um, there, there's sort of two things we're going we're gonna to be leaning on. Um, one is that a coworker's wage forecasts future, a, a worker's future wages 
even controlling for her wage. So think of the following. You've got two workers. They're currently making the same wage. They both go through a spell of unemployment and then come back out again. The one who had better quality coworkers, and in this case measured by having uh, coworkers with higher wages, comes out, with a, with a, out of unemployment with a higher wage, even though they went in with the same wage. Or it, put slightly different, they don't lose as much. Okay? So we're going to interpret that as something happened to them in that, in that firm they were in with these higher quality guys, which is going to look like they, they learned something from them. Okay? Um, that's true for the workers uh, who had better quality um, co-workers. For the guys who are very good, and so on average their co-workers are worse than them, going through this process, the, you know, how much worse their, their co-workers were doesn't seem to affect their outcome coming out again. Okay, so that's going to be, that's going to inform something, some of the, um, that's going to give us some information about what the learning looks like uh, in the model. Okay. A, a separate piece of information about how uh, my co the current coworkers affect future outcomes or what you would like to do comes from looking at job to job transitions. Okay. And so again, if we take uh, two individuals you know, say both currently earning the same wage, and we look at, we ask what is the probability that they're going to switch jobs next period. The guys who actually have much better co-workers than themselves switch at a lower rate. Okay. Um, controlling for age, controlling for lots of things. Okay. Um, and so that's going, to, uh, that's going to be a moment that tells us something about you know, you, you want to be around these guys who are much better than you. You're not trying to get away from them, which would not be true in, if the only force in the, in the world was, you know, strong production complementarities where you would try to get closer to people who are much similar to you. Okay. And again, if you're one of the ones who's, a, who's a better than the average, that doesn't seem to have any effect at all. Okay. So... When we put the model and some of those moments from the data uh, together, we're going to get uh, a couple of implications out of this exercise. Um, so the first one is that workers accumulate human capital faster when they're working with other people, and, they're, and especially when they're working with, with people who are much better than them, so there's some catching up. Um, it doesn't seem to... Um, be, we don't see workers getting pulled down in the sense that if I'm around uh, a lot of people worse than me, uh, they're, not, they're not, you know, sort of pulling me down. I'm, I'm sort of uh, pulling them up, teaching them sort of thing. Uh, we're we're going to find that production function uh, is super modular, so there's uh, complementarity across workers in the production side. And if we want to, uh, at least at the, the current, what I was to call a relatively rough calibration, the, we can attribute in terms of uh, uh, to learning from coworkers we're going to say that that accounts for about 17, sorry, 7% 7 of the human capital accumulation that workers get. The other part is just sort of the natural learning by doing, you know, uh, um, working, you, you, you gain more experience, and about 10% of, uh, of output. And this, you know, as we're, as we're sort of already um, alluded to, this um, technology of learning from your better coworkers is going to weaken the uh, positive sorting um, drive that the, uh, that the strong uh, supermodularity in, in production is going gonna, is gonna to give. And we're, we're going to do a few counterfactuals where we see, you know, you, you end up, you can, you know, play around with things a bit where in the data you get, or, or in the, in the, the outcomes you get are much more positively sorted, but um, it, that comes at the cost of lower human capital. Okay, so it, it, makes us have to think a little bit more carefully about making inference about um, you know, the cost of mismatch and things like this, some of that, uh, that several of us have been working on for a while. Okay, there's some related literature that I will uh, uh, skip over. So let's talk about the, the way we're gonna, we're gonna think about modeling this. We're gonna have a, um, Continuum of heterogeneous workers, some measure one. Um, they're going to be income maximizers maximize, uh, with a discount factor beta. And they're going to be heterogeneous with respect to the current amount of human capital they have, which we're going to think of as being uh, discrete. You know, some discrete amounts 
K1 to Kn here. Okay, so you think about uh, uh, you know, K, Kn being you know, more human capital than, than K1. Okay. On the firm side, um, there's going to be a continuum of homogeneous firms. There's going to be some measure N of these. We're not going to be modeling uh, entry and exit uh, at this stage. They're going to be maximizing present value of profits. And they're going to have a technology which you know, takes workers, produces output. And so they can, um, you know, it's, it's going to map the different types of human capital that they could have um, combined with the human capital of another worker or possibly um, there's no other worker, that, that's that, uh, that empty guy here. And so they can either be producing with one or two workers and they're going to produce some, some output. So that's the way we're going to think about the, the production. For the calibration, uh, just think of um, production of one worker is just equal to their human capital. Production of, uh, of the two workers is going to be this uh, um, CES production. Within a period, we're going to have entry and exit of people. <laughs> Okay, not, not firm, so workers are going to die, new workers are going to be born, um, drawing their initial human capital from a, from a different distribution. Um, human capital is going to be updated, search is going to take place, um, the firms are going to do some bidding to try to either poach or retain their workers, and we're going to have production take place. Okay. Um, okay. so. In the, this first substage, there's new workers, sorry, existing workers die or retire, however you want to think of that, with some probability, this shouldn't be sigma because I'm going to use that for something else, with some probability, let's call it C, and some measure of new workers, again, of, this, of the same measure, Z, are born, and they're going to draw their initial human capital from some uh, uh, density H here. Okay. That which, in, in general, is going to differ from, this, from the, uh, the distribution of human capital in the, in the population. And in terms of the uh, learning or the human capital accumulation, we're going to allow that to look different. So the probability that uh, a worker's uh, human capital is k hat next period when it was k this period can be different depending on whether they're currently unemployed whether they're employed by themselves or whether they're employed with another coworker. And in terms of the way that we're actually going to parameterize the model, uh, we're going to just we're going to uh, set this so that the unemployed, you know, lose human capital, you know, or drop down one level of human capital each period uh, with uh, with probability. Uh, alpha u, and then just stay the same with, with the complementary probability. Workers who are by themselves have some uh, constant probability of uh, increasing their human capital by one step. And then having a coworker, you have that same sort of just on the job learning that you, have, you would have if you were by yourself, plus something that depends on how much better your coworker is than yourself, okay? And we're, we, in, in principle, we allow, this should be a plus here, we allow it also to, you know, you to learn from your worst coworkers, okay? All right. Um, so employed, any individual employed worker is gonna separate each period Sorry, with probability I delta, yeah? Just ignore this because I'm going to delete it for today anyway. This last one, <laughs> this last one allows for either a differential speed of learning if you're around, if you're still around people but they're not as good as you, or possibly, um, you know, being dragged down a bit. Okay, but this is going to be zero for any for anything I say today. Because the data suggests that, or because the data suggests that, yeah. Um, okay, so this exogenous separations happen at rate uh, uh, or probability delta. There's going to be some endogenous separations as well. 
Um, unemployed guys are going to uh, meet a firm with probability lambda zero. Employed workers are going to meet a firm with probability uh, lambda one. And the firm that they meet, they're going to draw at random. That firm may have zero, one, or two workers, and those workers could be of different uh, types. Okay. So, in terms of um, setting the uh, values or sharing value uh, surplus between the, the worker and the firm, they're going. To, this is going to be straight uh, post avenue Robin, or I guess Caillou uh, post avenue Robin. We're going to think of the firm and the worker um, Nash bargaining over the uh, the terms of trade. So the worker is going to capture some shared sigma of the gains from trade. The firm's going to capture some share one minus sigma of the gains for trade, where the uh, the gains from trade are the sum of the values to the firm and the worker if they get together, net of what they could be doing if they didn't get together. Right? So the um, which would be the outside option of the worker, which would either be the value of unemployment if that worker is unemployed or they, their contribution to the joint value of their current firm. Okay, that's going to be their, um, their, uh, their baseline outside option. So can you um, suppose you're a match today and you're drawn by another firm. What, what you, can you stay with your old firm? Or you, you, can stay with, you can stay with your old, for old firm. Yeah, so that makes it your, uh, your, your, your outside option. Okay. Can you decide whether to stay or to work? Do you know the, the average quality of the, the future value of the firm? You know everything. You know yeah. everything. Yeah, it's, full, it's all done under full information. Okay. Um, you were going to say the average quality of the other co-workers. Yeah, you know that. Uh, um, so when this, when this, if the sigma is zero, then it's just going to look like Bertrand competition. Okay. And for the way I'm going to write things down after this, I'm going to actually put sigma equals zero just because it makes the, the, uh, the equations a lot shorter. Why is the quality of radius dependent on whether I have a worker or not? I didn't hear what But uh, why the combat rate of worker dependent on so these are just the, the contact rates. The actual transition rates will depend on all of those things. Okay. Does that answer your question at all? I understand that it could, um, but it doesn't, it doesn't have to, and you're still going to get the implication that the the rate, you know, the probability that an individual who has coworkers uh, switches jobs is different than the, if they didn't have coworkers, and it's going to depend on the quality of their coworkers. So, in, in the case where sigma is not zero, I'm just making sure I understand how this environment works. So, if it's not zero, you and I bump into each other, but I have a really good coworker in my current match. So then I'm going to be able to expect more surplus. Uh, so you're already going to be able to, even with the zero, you're going to be able to extract more surplus out of me as the hiring firm because your outside option is very good. If the sigma is, uh, is away from zero, you get that plus a little bit of the, of the additional value added you get coming into the new match. Right, but okay. so it can be zero and I still benefit from having a very good coworker yeah. today in my bargaining So firms have no control over whether they get contacted by workers or by people. Uh, that that is correct. You were two years old. You still can't get people. You have free disposal of people. You don't have to to you know if you're already at the you have you have your most you have your ideal but that's not guys. You, you would think that could be something that could be bargained over, right? Whether the firm would entertain other 
Okay, I see, I see what you're asking. Yeah. We're going to, so the answer was just that I agree. Yes, they don't have any control over that. It's just treated as, as exogenous. You could, and then uh, you would, you could, you could jointly determine that uh, during, the, during the bargaining, and you would want to set it at the efficient contact rate, presumably. That's a conjecture, but I'm pretty sure it's right. Um, OK, so the values going to the worker are going to be uh, determined by this bargaining th that I just discussed, or you know, Bertrand competition, if we think about the case of, of sigma equals 0. Um, and that, that does fix the value at the time of the transition, but then there's still this, uh, the wage that's slightly un, uh, indeterminate there. So we're going to pin that down in a way that, uh, that seems reasonable. We're going to assume that they, uh, the firm and the worker agree on a constant wage until there's some reason to renegotiate it. All right. So production, we already put these, uh, these functions up. So there's going to be home production, what a worker can do uh, if she's in the firm all by herself, and what a worker can do uh, when she has a, a, a co-worker. Okay. All right. So the equilibrium is going to be, um, the stationary equilibrium is going to be uh, defined by this set of value functions, which uh, describe the value to a firm who currently doesn't have any, uh, any workers, the joint value to a, a, a firm and worker with one, uh, with one worker of human capital K, the joint value to the firm and two workers uh, of, uh, of human capital K and L, and then the value of uh, an unemployed worker of particular human capital. And then there's going to be some stationary uh, measures of um, unemployment across the different human capital types uh, the, and workers across different possible combinations. Okay. So these values, and here we're going to set this, uh, this sigma to zero just to eliminate a bunch of, uh, uh, of terms, but I'll, I'll describe what's missing in a second. Um, so this is the, oh, sorry, they're not on this one though. This is the value to a, um, a firm who currently doesn't have any uh, a worker. And that's coming from, uh, in the future, they're going to, they can meet uh, someone. They can meet an unemployed worker uh, with probably the lambda naught. And that unemployed uh, worker would be of, all oh, this ends. Yeah, sorry, it we'll, we'll, uh, could be of type I, human capital type I. And you're going to hire that worker if the, if the surplus generated by hiring that worker is greater than zero, right? And the same thing you could meet, you could meet, run into a worker who's already employed, you could uh, buy herself, you could meet a, a worker who's already employed with another coworker, and whether or not that worker comes and joins you would depend on whether, you know, moving is better than, you know, where they currently are, um, and similar, both for if they're by themselves or they're already with someone, okay? Um, since, since firms are all uh, identical, this term actually goes to zero. There's no, no gain from moving workers from a single firm to another single firm. Um, when you look at the joint value of a match between a firm and a worker of, of a particular human capital, you know, they've got uh, production that's going to take place. And then next period, this match could exogenously separate in which the worker becomes unemployed, the firm becomes vacant. Uh, if that doesn't happen, this um, collective can you know, run into another worker. That the, the, per the new worker that they run into can either be unemployed, already working with someone, or sorry, already working by themselves, or already working with someone else. And again, we're going to uh, pull that worker into the current match, assuming that there's gains from doing that. And we have to compensate that worker uh, for bringing them in, because they're not yet part of the, that collective. Now, there's three other terms here that are zeroed out just because of the sigma equals to zero, and those are the ones involving this worker who's currently here could also meet another firm and decide to leave or not. Okay? Uh, with, the, with the pure Bertrand competition, that doesn't change the value of this match. With sigma equals 
with a non-zero sigma, it does change the value of this match because part of the value created by the match is the, is the possibility that I can go on and, and have an even better job in the future. Okay. Um, but just to keep things slightly cleaner, we're gonna, I'm gonna keep those off. And then again, you know, you can, uh, this is where you really see the value of zeroing out um, using the Bertrand competition because again, we have for the value of a joint pair of K and L, you have all the conditions of this um, collective meeting another worker and we decide do we want to hire this new worker and kick one of our current workers out or sort of upgrade our workforce is the way we want to think about this. Um, and then there are all of these terms about each of those current workers could also meet another firm and leave. Okay. And in the case of, uh, of, of Bertrand competition, you know, that results in a, in a, in a transition, but not in a change. It doesn't affect the, the, the value uh, to this collective. So we won't go through uh, all the details of those, but there's lots of um, moving parts and there's lots of things that can, uh, lots of transitions that can take uh, place here. Um, value, of a, value of unemployment is very simple in the case of Bertrand competition because it's just the value of uh, remaining unemployed all the time. Okay. Um, I'm not gonna, what, what kind of time are we at by the way? 18 minutes. 18 minutes, okay. Um, using those, the value functions, you can define all the possible transitions. I'm not going to, to talk through all of those, um, but those will give us the, uh, the steady state uh, or the stationary distributions of, of workers across, uh, across uh, matches and, and states. Okay. So in terms of, the, of uh, the calibration of this model or the, uh, the estimation of this model, um, there's kind of four key parameters that are going to govern what's going on. The first is the uh, supermodularity of the production function. Uh, the other ones have to do with the, uh, the human capital accumulation. So the probability of uh, just general uh, on-the-job learning um, and the derivative of learning for uh, the, the probability of of learning from your coworkers when they're better than you, okay. or when they're worse than you. Jerry, you may have said this. So, suppose you're in a match. Yeah. And you're uh, improving your human capital. Does your wage change, or do you have to wait until you have uh, a contact? You have to wait until um, you have a contact. Okay. okay. So, I would wait until someone tries to. Coach, and then I will tell my current employer, and he'll bump up the wage again. Okay. So there are, I mean, there are other ways to do it, but that's, it's going to mean that the wage is slightly lagging behind the, the human capital. Um, okay. So in terms of um, a heuristic discussion of, you know, how we're going to learn about these kind of things, they between within variation in wages is going to be within the model quite inf very informative on the, the um, how complementary or you know how strong the complementaries in production are in the sense that you know if if there's very very strong um, production complementarity so you want perfect sorting then all of the the, the wage variance is going to be between firms and the, the within is going to be very small. If it's small, it's going to kind of go the other way. So that's going to help us uh, uh, pin down that, uh, pin that down. And then these, um, these patterns that I already discussed at the beginning about um, how my future wage is affected by the quality of my, uh, of my <laughs> coworkers it's going to be informative about these learning parameters. So the elasticity of the wage in my current job with respect to the coworkers I had in the um, past employment spell, where we're calling employment spell being something that's separated by unemployment, is gonna uh, tell us about the, uh, the, how strong uh, learning is from my coworkers. On top of that, we can look at uh, how likely it is for me to leave my current match when I have really good coworkers. Okay. And again, uh, if um, the, 
the, the probability that I, that I leave my current job is going to be decreasing in this, in this uh, coefficient alpha 1, which is how much I learned from really good coworkers. Okay. Which one? This one? Yeah, we want we want to do that because we want guys to be you know sort of sampling from the same opportunities again. Okay. Um, so pretty much any model of uh, search, whether it's random or directed, if you have two guys who looked the same uh, going into an employment, their expected outcomes are going to be the same. Okay. The extent to which that they are not the same, and we can relate that to the quality of their coworkers they had before. We are going to say that tells us something uh, about, you know, they can't be the same. They must have got some improvement in their in their human capital. Uh, we're not that that's going to come here, but we're not going to use the wage info because I want to use two different things. I want to use wages, and then I also want to use the transitions. And so that I have kind of separate measures in some sense. They're, they're, I mean, they're informative on the same, on the same things, but I want to over identify it a little bit. Yeah. You swept under the rug multi worker farms. I mean, maybe it's just hard to do, but. By multi, you mean more than two? Well, let's suppose the average worker. Yeah. Yeah. Suppose the average. <laughs> The average quality of the average quality of the, the worker. Suppose the average quality is one. Whatever that means. You know, if you're having ten of them to draw from would give me more learning opportunities than just one. Or than fixed to average. You get to talk to more people. This is I've been thinking about that. It's not obvious at all how that would it's just not obvious how you can fit that neatly into the two. Um, so we, we're not, we set it up with the two because it's, well, one thing it's the minimum you need to have a coworker. Um, but also then we, we thought it would be natural then to think of the data core, you know, the data as being the average, the other person in the firm is, is the average in the, in the data. Now, um, We've worked out a, you know, a, a different model where we, we can have you know, many coworkers, but we can only then have two types of human capital, high or low. Okay. So these are, we decided that this one was a little bit more natural, or at least it was easier for us to think through the, uh, uh, the mappings. But not because you think that's empirical. Well, clearly, clearly the, 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 claim, the idea that there's only, that firms have at maximum two workers, I can reject that pretty yeah, easily by just looking. <laughs> I don't have to go very clear. But, but it's, an, it's an approximation for something, yeah, right? Okay, so I, I don't. I'm taking objection to that. That's a, that, that's a cheap shot. Suppose Kurt leaves, he decides to form his own university. He says, hey, David, yeah. come join me in, the, in my university. I can, yeah. Maybe he's average at his university now, and I'm excited to go there. But in his one-man university, I say, you know, maybe I don't want to go there. No. <laughs> <laughs> so I, this seems like it seems like the number of people is clearly, clearly a major source of learning. I don't mean, say the most important source of learning. I mean, you. you I, I almost yeah. vote for two types of human capital. That's fine. I'll take that. Because you can learn, you know, you get higher, okay, and then what's the probability of becoming high? But when you go to the data, three versus six versus 50 versus 100 probably makes a big difference. Um, I'm not sure that it does. We, I mean, we looked, we, we looked, you know, pretty exhaustively about what, what are the characteristics of the coworkers that seem to affect the future. And it looks very much like it's the mean. I mean, we put in things like the the max, the you know, you know different different percentiles, and you know if you put the mean in there, then those those sort of get swamped out. So I think I mean those are natural things to think about. It just doesn't seem to to to, to show up. 
Well, I, I, I understand. Yeah, no, I understand that. Um, um, so we didn't do we didn't do exactly. Um, we have some regression. Okay, actually, let me come back because I have a regression that has that controls for the number of okay. people, and I don't remember the number on it. Okay, but yeah, when we'll we get there, we, you, we can decide whether we should just stop. Okay. okay. Um, And then just sort of average wage growth over the life cycle is going to be at least tell us something about you know pinning down the the, the baseline learning by doing that we need. Okay. So the data I already alluded to what data we're using. Um, the the cut of it that we have has 11 states over this period 2001 to 2008. Um, uh, the the um, moments that we're going to pull off are going to be based on 10% random sample of what we have on there. And uh, uh, we're restricting them to prime age males. Um, we're going to call someone, we're going to use someone in our regression of, go, of the employed, unemployed, employed series if they had a year of full time, uh, full year work. Um, they were not employed at least one quarter in, in the next year. And then we see them employed at a different uh, uh, um, establishment in year T plus two. And we are looking at um, uh, firms with less than 250 workers, and the coworkers are everybody else at the firm. Now, we also did, you know, do the same empirical exercise using the Brazilian data that I, that I think Nick knows. And there, the, uh, a nice feature that that has that the US data doesn't have is it has occupation information. So we can do this only within occupation. It seems natural that you, you know, the janitor's probably learning from other janitors, not necessarily the CEO. Um, everything, you know, goes, everything looks approximately the same if you do it, if you do it just within occupation or within the whole firm. It doesn't seem to be a, a huge, certainly not qualitatively. Um, Okay, so we've got individual wage, we've got the wage of all the, of the coworkers, so everyone excluding uh, me, and then we've got my next period wage, and we want to look at this uh, coefficient on, uh, on, on the quality of my coworkers. Now, so, So this was was uh, yeah. was that it, it actually goes down a little bit uh, here when you have a lot. Now my I, I had the you know I had the opposite sort of uh, I, I think you're right that you have more opportunity, but it's also not it makes it less clear that you know the average of all of those guys is the right thing to do if there's a lot of different things being done at the firm. Yeah, right? So that's what I sort of that's why we would prefer. To, to be able to do the within education, within occupation stuff. Yeah. The US data just doesn't have that. The Brazilian data does. It has different problems, um, but we get roughly consistent um, sort of moments out of the two. Okay. Uh, right, so this is just a, you know, bit. I'm not gonna put a structural interpretation on this. The, this is something that we want the model to, to throw out. In the model, I can tell you what that, uh, what that's going to mean is going to mean that you're, you're learning from your cowork, your better coworkers. On our EE sample, same kind of thing. Um, and again, we could do we did that again on the on the uh, Brazilian data as uh, uh, as well. Let's see. And so here, where we are looking at, you know, even conditional on your own wage, um, how far away are you from the uh, from your coworkers? And here we get. That if you look at the, if you split the sample by the guys who are currently below the average, um, you know they're less likely to leave if they have uh, uh, the the better their coworkers are. If you look at the guys above average, you know they're slightly more, but only it's you know it's an order of magnitude smaller. So it's pretty uh, pretty tiny. So they, they it really it's really uh, leading us at least through the through the lens of the model of interpreting you know this learning up parameter. So it's, I was just looking at the numbers. So in both cases, so you're like three times more likely to leave if you're above average from your coworker on EDE and twice as likely to go EUE. 
It's not, sorry, no, no. What, did, what were you, say that again? Oh, yeah. Okay. Um, let's talk about that at another time. Okay. I, 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 <laughs> no, no, because I don't, I, okay. I know what you're referring to and I don't have a, I don't have a, I don't even have a 30 second answer, okay. so I probably just wasted 30 seconds, but I'm going to, okay. So we get a fair amount of, uh, of complementarity here. So um, the parameter is 1.96, um, a slightly more interpretable thing. If you've got two of the best guys and two of the worst guys, and you put the two best guys together and the two worst guys to get, uh, together, they're going to produce a little over twice as much as if you do the mixing. Okay. So there, there are reasonably strong production uh, complementarities there. Um, you know, there's sort of a, I don't want to do that. It's C, yes, so it's going to be 1 over 1 minus rho. Minus rho okay. So is it maybe minus 1.96? I'm going to, this. It's on the Leontief side of the copter. It's on the Leontief side of point I guess. I, uh, let's talk about that after as well, because I need to. Rho infinity is the answer. One minus one over two. Oh, okay. One minus two is negative one. One minus one over two. One minus half. So you do some learning on your own. You learn a lot more if, you have, uh, if you're hanging around smart people. And in terms of the implication for the, for the human capital, we're getting the following kind of thing. So the green histogram here is what you, what you get at birth. The blue is what the um, cross-section distribution looks like. So these guys end up learning you know, quite a bit, and you get more of a, a, a uniform. So there's you know, not a lot of really high-type guys uh, who are born, but you, you get up there. Um, in terms of how does your type affect, your current type affect uh, outcomes, you know, the, the low human capital guys are much, you know, they have high unemployment rates relative to everybody else. Um, they have uh, lower transition rates out of unemployment than everyone else. This is because they're less desirable to hang out with. Um, and they have higher um, um, job losing rates, so transitions from uh, employment to unemployment. The high types uh, have lower. Uh, and they also, but they also switch jobs more. Okay, so those guys uh, move around a lot more. Um, in terms of something else that the, the model is going to throw uh, throw out, you have sort of your your expected concave wage profile. Um, you know, the, this simulation was obviously not big enough, but uh, you have some sort of uh, cross-sectional distribution of wages, and the the wage distribution of the old stochastically dominates that of the of the young, which which is you know sort of all sort of things uh, that uh, you would you would you would get right off the right off the data. This is the the joint distribution of who's matched with who. Um, so the light colors are you know more matches. The dark colors are fewer matches. So there's a lot of low lows. There's some high highs, and then there's these groups here where there are. Uh, high types match with sort of moderate types, and these are guys where they're doing a lot of training to sort of get them up, uh, get them up here. Okay. So, just a couple of what, five, okay, a couple of um, counterfactuals to sort of pull apart uh, uh, what's going on in the model. And look at the role of the learning from your uh, from your coworkers, uh, the effect of changing uh, the degree of complementarity, so increasing it, and then just look at um, you know, something like a, a, an employment protection uh, legislation. So to assess the role of peer-to-peer -peer learning, we turn off learning from your peers okay, without changing anything else. So very, uh, you know, just, um, uh, just a peer comparative statics exercises. So human capital as a result falls by about 
uh, 8%. Output falls by a little bit less than that. Um, and the welfare of the, the best and the worst guys goes down substantially, or goes down more than everyone else, largely because we, we, don't, we are ruling out uh, exchanges uh, and you know, we're, we're ruling out these, these low guys uh, learning. Okay? The matching pattern, however, becomes much more positively assortive. So, um, the, um, what did I want to say from that? I'm not sure. Um, these are sort of the same pictures. The, the distribution of human capital, you know, it's much more, uh, there's much more mass down at the bottom, so you don't get uh, these high guys anymore. Um, that's just the difference on those, on those same bars. I'll skip that. And then this is the new joint distribution. So we've, um, we've put much more mass on this uh, diagonal here. This is the difference between the distributions. And so the big things that were gotten rid of were these places where we were you know, training, uh, training people. Okay. The other counterfactual, leave the learning as it is and crank up the importance of, uh, of the complementarity in production. So here we just uh, uh, double that. We get a much stronger uh, positive assorting. Um, but human capital here falls substantially because there's, a, there's sort of too much of putting um, the, uh, the best guys with the best guys and not enough, uh, not enough training of the, of the low types from the good guys. Uh, this particular counterfactual is done with that sigma equals zero, so the Bertrand competition. That's driving a fair amount of this loss of human capital. The reason is with that pure Bertrand competition, um, a current collective doesn't internalize the effect of improving one of the workers' human capital on their future jobs. Okay. So the version we have where that sigma is much closer to one, you don't get as dramatic of a, of a drop in human capital there. Um, but again, the same type of thing where we eliminate the schools and we get the, the, uh, the, stronger, uh, the stronger sorting. So in the, the one reason for, for doing these two exercises is it, uh, you know, it kind of points us to thinking pretty carefully about whether we want to interpret getting rid of these off-diagonal um, matches as improving efficiency. Right? Clearly, in a model where, where you're learning from your better coworkers, that's not the that's not the correct inference. Okay. What are we at in terms of time? One minute. Um, Okay, the last thing is uh, we'll just, we do this uh, exercise of putting in a uh, firing tax. Um, this changes the, uh, the allocation a lot uh, because the firing tax means you, know, you can no longer do things like train a worker, then get rid of them and replace them with another guy to train and these kinds of things. Right? It becomes quite costly to do that. And so we end up with actually a fairly negative uh, assorting sort of matching as you know, you, nobody wants to be with these, uh, these low guys. Um, and a lot of human capital is foregone here as well. Although I don't see the number. Um, okay, and then I'll just kind of conclude. So what we've, we've done here is uh, we've developed this, you know, a simple theory of knowledge diffusion in the workplace. Uh, we've used some moments out of the, out of the employer employee data to try to uh, tease out some moments that would tell us about the importance of um, production complementarities versus, uh, uh, versus importance of learning. And this is, this is uh, telling us that the you know, low workers do catch up with their, with their better coworkers. That sort of introspection would, maybe would tell us. Um, we don't seem to, uh, to uh, be dragging down you know, the really good guys from, from having them train a few people up. Um, this learning in the workplace can take, you know, that, that produces a motive for negative sort of matching, um, and this learning, you know, sort of matters a lot for output, wage growth, etc. And there's some other stuff we can do. Okay. But thank you.